one of the founding fathers of the modern amusement park. Walt Disney was an icon. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. From the many adventures of Mickey Mouse to the development of the first audio animatronic, his legacy has long stood as a beacon of his empire. Throughout the years, Walt consumed himself with innovative projects. In the months leading up to his death, he did not skip a beat. This is the story of Walt Disney's final days. We all know Walt Disney as a 20th century visionary and the father of Disneyland, but he was much more than that. He was a loving husband, a father of two, and a grandfather to seven. In the summer of 1966, Disney and his wife Lillian took all of their grandchildren on a vacation. To celebrate in Disney fashion, they rented a 140-foot yacht. Not only was this a family vacation, the Disneys were also celebrating their 41st wedding anniversary. A celebration of four decades on the beautiful waterways of British Columbia, Canada. They were spotted enjoying themselves on a local island where they docked their boat. Walt Disney, of course, with camera in hand, as he often did when he was young. The youthful sparkle in his eye almost looked as if he was a child again. Always full of fun and adventure, the Disneys loved their children, and this trip was truly a gift, one of the last ones he could give them. In September of 1966, Walt Disney was on the path to making a ski resort in Northern California, Mineral King. The Walt Disney Company had already won a bid to start planning this ski resort, so development was underway. As seen in this press conference, Walt in attendance with Governor Pat Brown discusses the plan for this exciting new opportunity. Even though Walt was eager about this project, he seemed to be a bit off. From the photos and videos, Walt looked to be worn down and not his vibrant self. Something was holding Walt Disney back, but he refused to accept slowing down. On February 22nd, 1963, Walt Disney received the George Washington Medal of Honor for his patriotism and good citizenship by none other than President Dwight Eisenhower. Walt was recognized as an ambassador of freedom for the United States. In Eisenhower's opening statement, he said, Freedom's Foundation at the Valley Forge honors Walt Disney, ambassador of freedom for the United States of America, for his educational wisdom and patriotic dedication in advancing the concept of freedom under God for his unfailing professional devotion to things which matter most, human dignity and personal responsibility, for masterful creative leadership in communicating the hopes and aspirations of our free society to the far corners of the planet. Walt was greatly honored to receive this recognition. It is said out of all of his awards, this one was closest to his heart. But in his mind, he was not worthy of such a title. Walt said, It's kind of hard to express my feelings about this. This is one of those moments when I feel entirely inadequate. It's something that sort of makes you feel rather humble. But I want the Board of Freedoms Foundation and everyone connected with this to know that I sincerely appreciate this tribute. And in expressing this appreciation, I think I should make a little confession, and that is that personally, I don't understand why the heck it was given to me. I've just been going along, doing what sort of comes naturally to me. I might say 
I've been selfishly indulging myself as an American, as a United States citizen, enjoying all the privileges that one has as a citizen. And it's only in times like this that you sort of wake up to the fact that what it really means to be a citizen. After receiving this award, Walt felt it was only necessary to honor the true heroes of this country. So he did. For the first time in Disneyland history, Walt holds his own ceremony honoring the real heroes. Medal of Honor recipients. Walt wanted to personally thank these war heroes and invited them to the happiest place on earth. On October 14th, Walt rolled out the red carpet and personally welcomed the heroes. After breakfast, the attendees were ushered to Disneyland's backstage area and given a proper entrance. The heroes were paraded down Main Street, USA on Disneyland's transportation fleet, the Omnibus, Surrey, and Fire Engine, and made the final stop at their destination in the Main Street Opera House. From there, they would watch a private showing of great moments with Mr. Lincoln, followed by a word from Walt himself. Being the patriot that he was, Walt wanted to leave a legacy and chain of respect for those to follow. This celebration of heroes has continued at Disneyland every year since Walt's inaugural event. Some people may think that this is the last trip to Disneyland for Walt Disney. But through research we've uncovered that this wasn't Walt's final trip to Disneyland. In the fall of 1966, Disneyland chief photographer would capture Walt's last visit to the happiest place on earth. Here is the account of Rene Bardu. There's a little story of when I was shooting that particular picture. It was shot on a roll of flex, and there was 12 pictures on a roll. I had shot 11 pictures of Walt at a different angles, watching for a smile, watching to make sure Mickey was looking the right way, making sure the castle spires weren't hanging out of his ears. Anyway, I had shot 11 pictures, and I had said, thank you, Walt, that's it. He then told me at the studio, we treat film like paper clips. You shoot, shoot, shoot all the film you need because if it's not in the can, you will never have it. So he asked me to shoot one more. So I shot one more and he said, that's fine, Renee, and he walked away. Walt Disney was always working on many projects. One of those projects included the merger of the Chouinard Art Institute and the Los Angeles Conservatory of Music and the CalArts, a centralized institution so that his people could get the training they needed. To this day, CalArts is one of the most reputable art schools in California and produces some of the leading animators. Never far from the studio, Walt was also giving his personal touches on the last film he would ever work on, The Jungle Book. But there was something bigger on the horizon, something that would cast a shadow on all of his previous projects. Disney was heading into unknown territory. Walt and his team were constructing a roadmap for the city of tomorrow. The Florida Project, as they called it, would be a fully functioning city with even an amusement park like that of Disneyland. They called it Epcot. Walt was very eager to present this project to the world, and so he did on October 27th in his feature, 
Epcot film. This is the last time the public would ever see Walt on film. Hiding in the vault of Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California, is the last known film appearance of Walt Disney. It wasn't until recently that Disney archivists discovered this footage. So close to his ultimate fate, Walt powered through this with as much strength as he could bear. But you could tell something was just not right. Good evening, friends. I'm sorry to have to welcome you to this invitational showing of Follow Me Boys in this way. I'd give anything to be there with you. But this seems to be one of those times I'm tied down here at the studio night and day. Of course, it's always this way when we're shooting a picture. And it so happens we're in the middle of shooting one right now. It's a comedy feature called uh, Blackbeard's Ghost, starring uh, Peter Ustinoff, Dean Jones, and Susan Plachette. Now, we've completed quite a few pictures since finishing Follow Me Boy. But there's one special one that I just have to mention. It's titled The uh, Happiest Millionaire. Now, this is one we call a happy family musical. It's the true story of the fabulous Anthony Drexel Biddle family of Philadelphia in the era of 1917. Now, the stars are Fred McMurray, a real Disney favorite, as Mr. Biddle, the lovely Greer Garson as Mrs. Biddle, two newcomers, Leslie Ann Warren and John Davidson playing Cordelia Biddle and Angie Duke. And it was the romance between these two that brought together the, together the Biddle and Duke family. And introducing the fabulous Tommy Steele, star of the Broadway hit Half a Sixpence. Tommy plays the part of John Lawless, the butler. Now there's a sequence in the picture that I'd like very much to run for you. It's that part where Tommy, fresh off the boat from Ireland, has been sent by an employment agency to the Biddle home to apply for the job as butler. He walks in unannounced, and this is what happened. Well, that's just one of the many songs in the show. And naturally, being part Irish, it's one of my favorites, of course. Now, The Happiest Millionaire won't be released until late next year. So let's get on with the business at hand, and that is Follow Me Boys. To us, this is a very special kind of motion picture, and one of which we're very proud. It has a fine cast, and uh, oh yes, you're about to meet a 15-year-old boy for whom I predict a great acting future. His name is Kurt Russell. I hope you enjoy the show, and incidentally, have a handkerchief handy. If you're like me, you're not only going to laugh a lot, but you're going to shed a few happy tears. So thanks for coming, and again, I'm sorry I can't be there with you personally for this occasion, but here now is Follow Me Boy. On November 2nd, 1966, Walt had been experiencing neck and leg pain from an old polo injury, so he proceeded to get surgery. Walt had a series of pre-operative x-rays taken at the hospital closest to his Burbank studio, the Providence St. Joseph Medical Center, during which the doctor discovered a malignant tumor that spread to his entire left lung. The doctor gave Walt anywhere from six months to two years to live. His life had a short clock. Just 19 days later, surgeons removed his left lung. On his 65th birthday, he was readmitted to the hospital with what was described as a routine post-operative checkup. This time, he never checked out of the hospital. Walt, being the man he was, refused to let anyone see him in the hospital, 
except for his immediate family. He didn't want people to see him like that. During one of his final trips to the studio lot, Walt told his right hand Marty Schuyler, goodbye Marty, which was unusual for Walt because he never liked saying goodbye. On December 15th, 1966, in the company of his family, Walter Elias Disney passed at the age of 65. Walt's daughter, Diane Disney Miller, said that during his final moments, his beloved brother, Royal Disney, who had helped him secure financing to make his dreams of Disneyland come true, was sitting at the foot of his bed. Massaging his feet just as he passed, saying, Well, kid, this is the end, I guess. Walter Elias Disney passed just 10 days after his 65th birthday. Even though Walt's health decline was continuously reported by the media, that didn't stop the world in its tracks when Walt passed. A nation was in mourning. Flags across the country were at half-mast. Following his wishes, there was a private funeral service for immediate family at the Little Church of the Flowers at Forest Lawn. Afterward, he would be cremated, then laid to rest at his final resting place in Forest Lawn, just a few minutes away from his studio. 31 years and one day later, his wife Lillian Disney would join him in Forest Lawn. They would forever spend eternity laid to rest in a small garden next to the Freedom Mausoleum. In life, Walt Disney innovated the art of synchronized sound and cartoons, one of the founding fathers of the modern amusement park, and captured our hearts with imaginative storytelling. He also holds the record for the most Academy Awards received, 32 in total. Where would this world be without people like Walt Disney?